Danny, I remember being shocked when the genetic uh, uh, codes were, were, were uh, analyzed and it showed the very high percentage that our genome has with various plant genomes. Uh, your book, uh, What Do Plants Know, um, uh, kind of takes it one step further uh, to deal in the area of sentience. So what do plants know? What does that question mean? Well, it's a great question. Can we even use the word no yeah. when we're talking about plants? So if we take the broad sense, you know, plants know quite a lot. And if we look at, you know, that we know things through our senses, it ends up that plants have all the senses we do. Plants know, and I'm going to use a lot of air quotes here, you know, where the sun is, because we could say that they sense it, they see it. Um, you know, plants know when they're being touched or blown in the wind because they can feel it. Plants know when their neighbors are sick because they actually smell them. Mm. Um, plants know what direction they're going because they can feel, they have a sense of balance. So they actually know quite a lot. And plants obviously don't have a nervous system. So how does this happen? Well, that's maybe the cool mm. and the scary part. So if plants know all these things, so if a plant knows its place in the world, it knows what the weather is, it knows what its physiological situation is, if it knows what the physiological situation of its neighbors are, you know, it's constantly integrating signals from the sun, from its neighbors, from the touch, and to yield a plant exquisitely fitting for its environment. And it does all of this integration, all this communication without a nervous system. What does this say about the need of a nervous system? First of all, it says that the nervous system for us is one way of integrating signals. But it's not the only way of integrating signals in biology. Or maybe at a deeper level, integration of signals or communication between cells is necessary for all life. So it's not so surprising that plants do that. All right, so I mean, how does it literally work? Uh, take some, some examples. Uh, where a plant, for example, will sense its neighbors. Uh, you had something that if, if, if a neighboring plant or tree is infected with some kind of an insect, yeah. that there's some kind of communication. So, so this was actually an experiment that was first published in the early 1980s by a graduate student at Cornell University named Ian Baldwin. Um, he's now a uh, director of one of the Max Planck Institutes, one of the premier institutes of biology in the world. And what he showed in the early 1980s was that if you take a, let's say a willow tree, and it's attacked by beetles, well this had been known actually before, um, the trees next to it become, start making chemicals which repel the beetles. And so his hypothesis was is that there's some type of communication between the trees. And so he did a, a quite simple experiment actually. Take a tree, just cut its leaf, and then check what's going on in the leaves of the trees next to it. What he found is if you cut the leaf, and then check for the chemicals in the trees next to it, the leaves next to it, these leaves started making chemicals which would repel beetles. And from this he came to the, the conclusion that one leaf is releasing into the air a volatile chemical. When it's cut or when, when it's, it's cut damaged. or when it's eaten, yeah. when it's damaged. Yeah. And then the neighboring leaf is absorbing this chemical, what I would call smelling. <laughs> you know, that's, and then that's serving as information to know, oh, you got to protect yourself. I and mean, it's legitimate to call it smelling because that's how we smell. Yeah, by the except same without time. a nose. Yeah, right. But, right. Um, <laughs> you know, so that when this was originally published, the popular press went nutso. It was sort of like, you know, all this altruistic uh, activity. Uh -huh. You know, one tree is screaming, yeah. oh, watch out, yeah. protect yourself. Yeah. You know, the New York Times had a great, uh, a great editorial said that a, uh, a tree's blight is better than its bark. <laughs> but now comes the question of intent. So obviously when you cut, what he showed is that when you cut one leaf, the neighboring tree can, can pick up this information. Mm -hmm. But there's another possibility. Mm -hmm. and that possibility is when you've, this leaf is damaged, it wants to warn the neighboring branch on the same tree, we better protect ourselves mm -hmm. to save our singular organism. And that maybe the neighboring tree is just eavesdropping. Yeah. And, and, and since there's not psychologists of trees, we can't ask the tree, oh, what did you want to do? Yeah. But we have to ask the question when you say it wants to, right. um, it, it doesn't have that in, inner uh, I'm not, I'm not an, saying there's intent. Right, but, but there's a reason that happened, and there's an evolutionary reason. So right. describe what, what would be a hypothesis evolutionary, from an evolutionary perspective, of how that would develop. Well, this is all organisms exchange information. You know, even humans communicate through a sense of smell. You know, 
That's how we know if food is fresh or not fresh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if women have been living in a dormitory room for the same amount of time <laughs> and, and, and they start uh, menstruating yeah. at the same time. It's yeah. not that they've decided, yeah. oh, wow, let's coordinate yeah. ourselves. Yeah. You know, or in literature, we talk about the smell of fear is in the air. Yeah. So there's often you know, volatile signals mm -hmm. that are used for communication all throughout the, 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 king, uh, the animal and plant kingdoms. Mm -hmm. So there, the advantage here, of course, is for a plant to be able to protect itself and survive an onslaught. So if we compare between plants and animals, or between a plant and you, you know, what's the biggest difference between them? Is that animals, if they're in a situation they don't like, they can run away. So for example, if you're cold, you could go down to Florida or put on a sweater. If you're hungry, you know where to find food. If you're thirsty, you know where to get a drink. And if you're looking to, for a mate, I guess you can know where to find it. But think of a plant. You know, a tree outside is literally rooted in the ground. It can't move. It has to survive 100 degree summers and below freezing winters, periods of drought, periods, huge amount of rain, lots of sunshine, a little bit of sunshine, onslaughts of insects and bacteria, and it has to reproduce. And so how does it do this? It has to be acutely aware to its environment so that it can change its metabolism. It could change its biology, change its growth in order to survive. And so while animals can run away, we have behaviors of running away from bad situations, a plant has to adapt. And this adaptation is actually genetically much more complex than what mm. goes on in... Let's, let's take a, a simple example that most of us know that plants will seem to bend towards the light. They do bend to the light, okay. yeah. So how does that happen? So again, we all see this on, our, as you, on a windowsill when a plant bends to the light. Why is it bending to the light? Because it wants to find the light in order to do photosynthesis, in order to make its... Sure make its sugars and then grow. But how does that so literally a plant, happen? Well, a plant sees the light the same way that our retina sees the light. Plants have photoreceptors, proteins which are attuned biochemically to respond to different wavelengths. The plant senses where that wavelength is coming from and then it changes its growth patterns and bends to get so, to it. So how does that literally happen though? I mean, so, you, you have, you, what, are the, what are the frequencies that are? So that are, this is what, so here's what gets even more, Amazing. If you give a plant red light on one side, let's say 690 nanometers of light, yeah. and blue light on the other, 420 yeah. nanometers, it'll grow to the blue light, not <laughs> to the red. So not only do plants respond to light, they differentiate wavelengths. Yeah. This has been known actually for well over yeah. a century. Colleagues of Darwin did experiments like this. Yeah. Darwin did experiments of plants bending to light. They're very sensitive, even very small, very dim amounts of light. Um, and so but, how, how but they can, so but plants have an array of photoreceptors, which allow them to respond to blue light in order for it to bend, which call this phototropism. Mm -hmm. But they also have photoreceptors which respond to red light and to far red light. That's like the wavelengths around 740 nanometers, which we see just as the sun is going down, which allow it to know when day has started and yeah. when day has ended, yeah. the length of the days. This is how plants tell the seasons. Mm -hmm. Plants have photoreceptors which respond to UV light, which we're blind to. They well, we have about four different photoreceptors in our, types of photoreceptors in our retinas. Plants have upwards of 12, 13 different photoreceptors, which allow it to respond to a whole wide wavelength. And that's spectrum. because light to a plant is, in a sense, more important to it than light than is it to is us. That's right. So plants don't see in pictures like right. we do, but they see wavelengths that we're blind to. Hmm. What are some other senses that plants have? Well, plants have a sense of touch. They feel. You know, the, the most obvious one is in the Venus, Venus flytrap. Fly yeah. And everyone has seen the Venus flytrap. You could see these various videos online where a fly comes around, yeah. gets to the middle, and yeah. then it closes. <laughs> right. And you know, there's a couple of things going on here. Not only does it know that the fly is there, it waits until it's in the middle. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. actually, oh, yeah. it, it's pretty smart. Yeah. Um, and when, when we look at a Venus flytrap, not only do we see a sense of touch, we also see a sense of, well, we see memory. Memory. Yeah, those are two words that are difficult yeah. to get together, plants and memory. Yeah. Why? Because the way a Venus flytrap works is that when a fly, or actually a scientist, you can do it with, a, like with your finger or with yeah. a toothpick, there's like these hair-like structures. Touch receptors, yeah. And when two of them are touched, then it'll close. Uh -oh. You touch the first one, it won't close. Touch the second one, it'll close, but only if you touch them within about 25 seconds. If you wait <clears throat> a minute, 
It won't close. So it's sort of like a short-term memory. Yeah. Now, if I tell you my phone number right now, you'll remember it. If I right. ask you in two minutes, you'll right. have forgotten right. it. So here, the plant knows the first hair has been touched, waits for the second hair. You wait too long, oh, I forgot. I'm not going to close anymore. <laughs> and, and so how does it remember? What, what, what is that? Because we, we have, we'll have a neural circuit that'll right. be a short-term memory. Right. And uh, we know how that works, but how, how does it work? Well, it's electricity, just like in our neural circuits. Yeah. What happens is you'll get a potential when you touch the first the first hair, but this potential isn't high enough to cause the closing. Oh. You have to, let's say you need one and a half, one, one, one potential be one X of a potential, yeah. and it starts dissipating. In order to close, you'll need, let's say, one and a half X. So if you touch the second hair- Within a certain time. Within a time, period. then you'll, you know, you're dissipating, then you'll okay. go above the threshold, and right. then it'll close. Right. So it's an electrical memory. <laughs> it's not too dissimilar from what goes on in our own mm. brain. Other, other senses? Yeah, sure, a plant, um, well, we can ask, uh, if I'd ask you a question, what type of music do plants like? And see, this is actually one of the reasons I got started writing my book is because it drove me nutso that people were shocked to hear that plants differentiate between red and blue. Yeah. They thought that was the coolest thing in the world, but everyone was convinced that a plant likes classical music. <laughs> you know, there was a book that was published, The Secret Life of Plants, about uh, 40 years ago, that talked about plant responses to music. Now, the spoiler is plants don't care about music, mm -hmm. you know. Well, of the hundreds or thousands of articles about plants responding to light and to touch and to smell, there's maybe three publications that talk about plants and music, and in each one, the plants responded better to the music that the scientists liked. <laughs> really? Yeah. Which makes sense because what's the so, like so, we're, so we're better gardeners when we listen to music <laughs> that we like. But if you think about it, music and plants have no evolutionary connection. Hmm. You know. So if a plant would hear, what would it be listening to? What would it make evolutionary sense for a plant to develop a sense of hearing? So I was actually involved in a series of experiments over the past two or three years where we asked the question, can a plant hear a pollinator? Hmm. That's a much more difficult experiment hmm. than classical music or versus rock and roll. And so the hypothesis was that there would be an advantage for a plant listening to a pollinator and then when a pollinator is near, making more nectar. Yeah. Yeah. And what we showed in this series of experiments is that at least one plant, it's called the evening primrose, when it hears a pollinator, it Meaning makes... Meaning a, a flapping of a the wing. Fla that flapping of the wings. Right. It makes nectar that has a higher sugar content. But when we expose it to the sound of a non-pollinator, it doesn't. Wow. And you can actually make a synthetic sound of that frequency and it'll respond. But to the non-pollinator, it won't respond. And that makes evolutionary sense. Because why should you make a good nectar if no one's going to drink it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but it's um, the evolutionary picture is really remarkable uh, to see how that, that mechanism would, would work on a, on a random basis. And then that was selected. I mean, how? Sure. There, so the question whether we're talking about directionality in evolution or, you know, there's, you know, there's a randomality. But then when you develop the sense or you develop mm -hmm. the ability, then it gets um, selected for. And then that's why there's, you know, again, when we're talking about plants, we're talking about 200,000 different species. Yeah. Not all plants would differentiate between pollinators. Oh, sure. You know, so sure. all would have their own senses. Yeah. But of course, that's how the evolution would lead to the fact that they would be, there's an advantage to responding to the pollinator in the area. So having lived with plants, having appreciated their, uh, their ability to know various things, uh, do you feel closer to a plant? Do you, are you less likely to step on one? <laughs> I have no trouble stepping on a plant, <laughs> but I definitely appreciate the complexity. You, know, you look at the trees in the corner of your house plants, and you just imagine to yourself everything it's being exposed to, and that it's constantly responding. The fact that we don't see it, doesn't mean that there's not a really beautiful complexity going on at the genetic and cellular level.